Welcome everyone to another GIA knowledge session, a series of talks and seminars about gemology fueled by our decades of research. Today, I'm your host, Evan Smith. Diamonds and colored stones like rubies and emeralds are often considered to exist in entirely different realms in gem and jewelry industries. And this might be partly due to the different ways in which they're mined and brought to market, but both diamonds and colored stones are natural samples of the earth that hold clues to its complex geological history. To discuss some of the common facets between these two groups, we're joined now by GIA research scientist, Dr. Karen Smith, and GIA Senior Manager of Research, Dr. Aaron Palke. Now, before we get started, a reminder to everyone in the audience, you're automatically muted, but if you do have questions, please type them in using the Q&A feature you should find at the bottom of the screen in Zoom. And at the end of the discussion, there'll be a Q&A session where Dr. Smith and Dr. Palke will have a chance to answer some of your questions. We'll also send a recording of the session to you later today. And that message will also have a survey where you have the chance to provide some feedback. And with that, I'll pass you over to Dr. Karen Smith and Dr. Aaron Pelkey. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so as, as Evan mentioned, we're going to be talking a little bit about diamonds and colored stones today. Um, when I first asked Evan if he would be willing to moderate for us, he sort of made a joke and asked like, oh, is this going to be a showdown? And I was like, well, yeah, it is. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about diamonds, um, or I'll be talking about diamonds, because um, my research is mainly focused on diamond geology and mantle geochemistry. So trying to understand, um, you know, the ages of diamonds, where diamonds form, how we can better explore for them. So a lot of my research is focused on diamonds. Um, and so the other half of the showdown um, is going to be led by Aaron Palke, and I'll just let him introduce himself. Yeah, thanks, Karin. Uh, I'm super excited about this, too. You know, I, th I think I like this idea of a showdown. Um, so in contrast to Karin, who does a lot of research with diamonds, I do colored stones. And Karin will tell you what a colored stone is in a minute. But basically, I do a lot of research with rubies and sapphires and emeralds. Um, so, but you know, at the same time, I've, I'm really interested in diamonds. I just never had much of an opportunity to do much with it. So um, I'm excited to be here with my, my colleague and my nemesis for the day, Karin. Um, <laughs> and hopefully, hopefully later on, we'll find some common ground and we'll, um, we'll be friends again at the end of this. We'll, we'll try, we'll try to find some common ground. Um, so some questions that we often get is what exactly is a colored stone? Um, because this is a, a terminology that is used in, in the gem trade. Um, but it's not always well defined. Um, and so we, we just thought we just, you know, just a few slides, you know, what exactly is a mineral? What is a colored stone? Um, so we all start off sort of on the same page here. Okay, so um, a colored stone is a non diamond, non pearl mineral that is used as a that is gem quality. So it can be used as a gemstone. Um, so the colored stone definition does not include colored diamonds. So Somewhat ironically, a colored diamond does not consider to be a colored stone. Uh, but for the purposes of this definition, a colored stone refers to non-diamond, non-pearl minerals that can be used um, as gemstones. Uh, so what is a mineral? A mineral is naturally occurring. That means that it, um, is a, it occurs on Earth. So it's a terrestrial mineral, so not something that comes from another planet. It is also not biogenic. Um, it is solid. It has an ordered internal structure. Um, and it has a very specific chemical composition. So regardless of whether a mineral is grown in the lab or grown in the earth, if it has, a, if it has an identical chemical composition, it is the same mineral. So a lab grown diamond versus a, a natural diamond, they're the same mineral because they have an identical chemical composition. The same with lab grown corundum versus gem quality rubies or sapphires, they're identical minerals because they have the same chemical composition. Uh, rocks are made up of different minerals. Um, and so when you go, go outside, go for a walk, you pick up a rock, that rock is made up of different minerals. Um, and so what are some of the gem quality minerals um, that we commonly look at? Um, so here's diamond. And um, so for all of these slides, the next few slides, we're gonna be showing the minerals in their original host rocks. Um, and so the two images that I have here are 
um, diamond still contained within the kimberlite host rock. So kimberlite is the volcanic rock that brings diamond um, up to the surface. Um, and then the chromophores, so diamonds can be different colors depending on which impurities um, or defects or other elements are present in the crystal structure. Um, so nitrogen and vacancies and boron can all cause um, the diamond bo um, body color to be slightly different. So nitrogen could cause it to be yellowish, um, vacancies cause it to be green, um, and boron, um, rare boron bearing diamonds that Evan has studied, um, they're blue. Um, so corundum, once again, showing them here, um, still contained within their host rock. Um, so corundum is aluminum oxide, um, and depending on the impurities, it could be two different gem varieties. Um, so if there is um, chrome three plus in the structure, um, it is a ruby, so it has a red color. Um, and sapphire has, can be colored by iron, titanium, and some others. Um, and sapphire, we've shown it here in blue, but sapphire is really um, any corundum that is, any gem quality corundum that's not red. Um, and hopefully if I've made any mistakes with that, Aaron will surely correct me later. Um, and then beryl um, is a little bit more of a complicated mineral. Um, so the, the formula is up there, I won't go through it. Um, and emerald is the gem quality variety um, and the color is due to either chrome three plus um, or vanadium. Um, and then another variety of beryl um, that is a gem quality mineral is aquamarine. So these are the same mineral, they just have slightly different impurities substituting into the crystal structure. Um, and so for aquamarine, we have iron two plus and iron three plus. Um, and I think it's the charge transfer between those two states um, that cause the light blue color um, in aquamarine. Um, and then the last mineral we'll be talking about is tourmaline. Um, very complicated mineralogy, <laughs> or mineral structure, I guess. Uh, very complicated chemical formula, should I say. Um, and what we've given here is the lidocote, lidocotite formula that is named after lidocote um, from the GIA. Um, and Erin will be talking about why uh, this complicated chemical formula is actually works for our benefit because we're actually then able to do country of origin determination slightly easier than we can for minerals with a very simple chemical um, composition like diamond or ruby. Um, and then we also have some colored stones that can be included in diamonds. Uh, so these are beautiful colored minerals um, that are included inside diamonds. Um, so these are mineral inclusions that are trapped um, in the diamonds while they grow. Um, Evan and I both study um, these inclusions to tell us something about the deep earth. Um, and so these are just some examples of the most colorful minerals that, that we can see in diamonds. Um, so orange garnets um, from the host rock Eclogite, um, some pinkish purple garnets from Peridotite, and some greenish kind of pyroxene, um, also from uh, Peridotite uh, deep in the earth. Uh, so where exactly do diamonds form? So before I start this section, maybe I should just say that sort of our format now for the rest of the talk, now that we know which minerals we're going to be talking about, um, how we're going to go through the, the rest of the talk is that I'm going to start with diamonds and then Aaron is going to then take over the same topic just for, um, for colored stones. So I'll start with where diamonds form and then afterwards Aaron will take over with where, do, where does ruby, sapphire, tourmaline and beryl form. And then we'll sort of switch back and forth between us for these different topics um, so that we can compare. Um, okay, so where do diamonds form? Uh, so all diamonds, all natural diamonds on earth um, form deep in the earth. Um, it's in an inaccessible part of the earth called the mantle. Uh, so where exactly is the mantle? Um, so here on the left hand side, I just have a cross section um, through the globe. Um, and so the very thin portion here at the top, this black line is the crust. So that is the layer of rock that we're standing on. So the earth's crust is really just the very thin layer um, sort of on the outside. But the majority of the earth is inaccessible to us. That's the mantle and then the core. Um, and so the majority of diamonds come from this region of the earth called the mantle. Um, and so on the right, we have a cross section um, through the mantle. Uh, so we have the upper mantle, the transition zone, and the lower mantle. Um, and I've illustrated here where different diamond varieties actually form. So the majority of diamonds form um, below the Earth's oldest continents, which are known as cratons. 
So the majority of diamonds that we see at the Earth's surface today are forming in, in this region of the mantle below um, the cratons. So these are Earth's oldest continents that have been stable for at least one billion years. Um, and then the upper mantle, the transition zone, and the lower mantle um, also have diamonds. Um, and these are the diamonds that Evan has been studying. So Evan's work has shown that there's a variety of diamonds called the clipper diamonds that are forming in the transition zone. Um, so these are larger diamonds that are forming um, from metallic melts in the transition zone. Um, and then the blue boron bearing diamonds are forming here at the boundary between the transition zone um, and the lower mantle. So we have diamonds that form at a wide range of depths um, in the Earth's mantle. Um, and here are some of the host rocks. These are what the host rocks of diamonds look like. So in the lithosphere, this is uh, below the Earth's oldest continents. In the cratonic lithosphere, the two main rock types um, that diamonds form in are eclogite and peridotite. Um, so eclogite is the one host rock for diamond, um, and they are characterized by these orange-red garnets. Uh, peridotite um, has these pinkish-purple garnets. So uh, diamondiferous or diamond-bearing peridotite is actually extremely rare, um, but here we have a beautiful example of a diamond-bearing uh, peridotite from the Fort Alicorn deposits um, in Saskatchewan. We actually hardly ever, or actually never, find diamonds still contained within their sublithospheric coast rocks. So unfortunately, I only have a picture of a beautiful large diamond there, um, but it, we don't have any examples, or we, we've never seen examples of a sublithospheric diamond that is still contained within its sublithospheric host rock. But these are the sort of the three main um, varieties um, of environments where diamonds can form. There are some, obviously, some subgroups within those sections, within these groups, but these are sort of the three main environments um, in which diamonds are forming in the deep earth. Uh, so if diamonds are forming in the deep, inaccessible earth, in a place that we could never go, how is it that we have diamonds at the earth's surface today? So kimberlites are a rare volcanic eruption that bring diamonds up from great depths. So they originate around 200 kilometers below the Earth's surface. They're extremely explosive, and they're thought to reach the surface in a matter of hours or up to maybe a day or two. Um, so these are extremely rare. Um, and so the last diamond bearing eruption that became an economic diamond mine um, are the Ellendale lamprites actually from Australia. And these uh, erupted around 20 million years ago. So these aren't eruptions that are just happening every day. Um, they're super rare. Um, they come from really deep in the earth. Um, however, they bring up really valuable cargo to the surface. So they bring up these mantle rocks and diamonds um, that we can then study in order to understand the processes um, happening in, in the deep earth. And so sort of to summarize then, you know, where diamonds form is that they're, they're crystallizing at great depths in the earth from carbon bearing fluids or melts. And there's a few different environments in which they can form. Um, but they form at a variety of depths through the earth. And so geologists like me and Evan uh, really love to study inclusions and defects in natural diamonds in order to understand um, the processes um, that are occurring uh, deep in the earth. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Aaron um, and he'll talk to us a little bit about colored stones. Thanks, Karen. All right, so I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about the geology of colored stone deposits and with a few specific examples. Um, on the next slide, we'll bring up one of the main points. Um, and, and actually, I want to say right now, it's, I'm not going to go too in depth with any of this. If you guys want more information, um, more specific detailed information about the geology of colored stone deposits, my colleague, Wim Bertriest, he gave a great talk a few weeks ago um, about the geology of colored stone deposits. And it's up on YouTube. So if you want more details after this talk, I encourage you to go to, to YouTube and watch Wim's talk because he's got some great info in there. Um, but one of the main points here is that, uh, in contrast to diamonds, color stones form in a much different part of the earth. They form much closer to the surface in general in this region we call the crust. So the crust is basically where we guys, where we're, we're all standing right now. So you have um, the continental crust, which is the land we all live on. It's typically about 30 to 50 kilometers thick um, in most places. And then you have oceanic crust at the bottom of the seafloor. It's more like 10 kilometers thick, but it's basically the, the topmost skin of the earth 
And that's where all these color zones are forming. So on the next slide, we'll um, talk about more specifically environments in the earth in which you might form gem corundum. This is a great schematic diagram from a, an article recently published in Gems and Gemology by Giuliani and Grote um, in the, the um, winter 2019 issue. And so what, this, what you're seeing here the, in the middle of this diagram, this big blob of land in the middle, that's meant to represent basically continental crust. Or uh, if you think of it another way, it's sort of like a tectonic plate. Um, and one of the great things about the crust for gemstone formation is that you have this huge diversity in different geological environments in the Earth's crust. Um, basically, the crust is like the outward expression of tectonic plates, so this, this concept of um, plate tectonics. When you have all these big pieces of the continental crust, these tectonic plates moving around, um, smashing into each other, ripping apart from each other, uh, building up these mountains and um, exposing rocks to different environments, different geological conditions. And you have all these different ways in which you can form different minerals. And you also have all these different ways in which you can form a single mineral like corundum. So for instance, in this diagram, uh, on the right-hand side of the diagram, you're looking at magmatic corundum, magmatic gem, uh, ruby, and sapphire. And it, I guess I need to be a little careful with this because really, um, if you're looking where Karin's got her mouse, this is sort of where you might find form these gem corundum um, in a magmatic context. And it's, it's actually more closely, um, we think our geological model suggests that the corundum is forming probably more close to the boundary between the mantle and the lower crust. So it's not exactly entirely in the Earth's crust, but it's right there at the boundary. And so what's happening is we have this heat welling up from the Earth's mantle and heat and magma is coming from the Earth's mantle and these magmas interact with the Earth's lower crust forming gem corundum. And because you have all these, this magmatic activity, sometimes you also have volcanic activity as well. And so some of these magmas will erupt to the Earth's surface, pick up these gem corundum on the way to their surface and bring them to uh, the surface where we can mine them today. And so actually this is sort of similar to the situation with diamonds, right? Where you have the, um, the gem corundum or the diamonds forming deeper in the Earth brought up by volcanic activity. Only in this case, the, the gem corundum is telling us more about the, what's going on geologically at the crust mantle boundary, whereas diamonds are probably telling us more about what's happening deeper in the Earth in the mantle. Now, in contrast, on the left side of the diagram, we have metamorphic ruby and sapphire. Um, and so in most cases, what's happening here is that we have um, continental collision, two plate tectonics, plate tectonics smashing into each other, um, and oftentimes burying rocks deep in the earth, exposing them to extreme pressures of temperature, extreme conditions of temperature and pressure, which kind of fundamentally alters the state of these rocks and it turns them into different rocks entirely. So you, for instance, you might take a limestone formed of calcium carbonate at the earth's surface, a sedimentary rock, you could bury it in the earth, turn it into a marble, recrystallize all that calcite. And in some cases you might also form grains of corundum in there. And you might form rubies in these marbles that are being buried when you have continental collision. Uh, but also you might have magmatites or granulites, um, other types of rocks in these metamorphic environments. Uh, so in the next slide, we'll actually show a couple examples um, of these different types of gem corundum. So on the left, we have two types of metamorphic corundum. In the middle actually is, is a marble hosted uh, ruby. So this is like, like I was saying previously, if you took a limestone, uh, probably with some clay minerals in there to, form, to give you some aluminum for the corundum to form, if you buried those limestones deep in the earth, turn them into a marble, you might form something like this. So you have rubies forming with calcite. Um, on the left, very left side, you have another type of metamorphic corundum. Uh, this is not a marble, it's, it's probably more like something that it was experienced in amphibolite grade conditions as some kind of a silicate rock with a lot of aluminum in it. And you expose it to high pressure and temperature forming corundum and other minerals in the rock. And then on the, on the right hand side of the diagram uh, is a magmatic sapphire. And this is a, actually a sapphire found in a type of rock called a lamprophyr, um, which is found at a place called Yogo Gulch in Montana. It's a little bit different than your typical magmatic sapphires, which are found in alkali basalts. But this type of rock, this lamprophyre, is, is sort of geochemically similar to those basalts and actually sort of geochemically similar to the lamprophyres, uh, the, um, the kimberlites that uh, Karin was mentioning earlier. So uh, on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit of, about beryl. And I'm not going to go too much into beryl because we just don't have enough time. Um, but I would just want to note that beryl is a really good indicator of what's going on in the Earth's crust. And the reason for this is that uh, one essential chemical component of beryl 
is this element beryllium. And beryllium is really only ever concentrated in the Earth's crust. Um, you don't really get concentrations of beryllium deeper in the Earth's mantle. And so when you find beryl, you know that, that you're looking at something that is reflecting geological processes in the Earth's crust. Uh, and on the next slide, we'll show a couple examples of different types of emerald formation. Um, so on the left is a, what we would call metamorphic or hydrothermal type emerald. This is like the classic Colombian type emerald where you have, um, you have sedimentary rocks that were metamorphosed, turned into black shales, and then you had uh, hydrothermal fluids circulating through these shales, picking up elements from different parts of the rocks and redepositing elements like beryllium and chromium in these fractures where the fluids are flowing, forming the perfect cocktail for emerald formation because you need both beryllium and chromium to form these emeralds. And you'll find them associated with pyrite and calcite and quartz and other minerals like this. And on the right is a, um, an example of a Russian emerald. So this is a, an emerald we call a magmatic related schistosid emerald. So essentially what's going on here is you have intrusions of granitic magma into the Earth's crust in places where you have um, what we call mafic rocks, rocks with a lot of magnesium and iron, but also a lot of chromium oftentimes, rocks like peridotites. Um, and when you have these granitic fluids coming from your granitic intrusions, they might be carrying a lot of beryllium from the granite and these fluids flow into these mafic rocks with have, which, have, which have a lot of magnesium and iron and chromium. And so again, you have this interplay between the beryllium from the, the granitic source and the chromium from the peridotite forming this cocktail to give you emerald formation. And I think on the next slide, we'll be talking about tourmaline. And we will be talking a little bit more about tourmaline later. Um, it's actually a really good example of some of the things we wanna talk about in terms of how we use trace elements to study these rocks and these gems. Um, what's shown here are some Paraiba tourmaline. So this is the copper bearing variety of tourmaline. And when you get copper in tourmaline, you get this really rich blue color. Um, and it really makes these stones, gives them a, a really rich, bright blue color that is really valued over the more typical kind of um, <clears throat> indicolite type tourmaline, which is colored by iron. And so on the next slide, we'll show a little bit about where these tourmalines form. And this is a diagram of a pegmatite. Uh, this is from Edward Gublin. This is a, an, a diagram that he put together a long time ago. Um, a pegmatite is essentially related to granitic intrusions again. Um, so basically what happens is if you have a big intrusion of a granitic magma into the Earth's crust, that magma starts slowly cooling, slowly crystallizing and solidifying. And a pegmatite is basically the very last bits of liquid left over from that granitic intrusion. And because it's the very last bit of liquid, you basically what happens is you start accumulating, accumulating all of these elements that don't wanna fit in other minerals like quartz and feldspar and mica. So you have enrichments of, mineral, of elements like beryllium and boron, which are essential for forming minerals like beryl and tourmaline. And so what happens is these, these late stage fluids from the granites oftentimes can escape from the granitic intrusions themselves and uh, go into the, the country rocks surrounding the intrusion. And if you're close enough to the Earth's surface, you can actually form these big open pockets where these pegmatites intrude into the, earth, into the country rock. Um, and when you form these open pockets, this is great for forming gem minerals, of course, because these open spaces allow for, for the crystallization of big crystals that are also quite gemmy because there's not a lot of other stuff around there to include the, the, the gem minerals there. And in the next slide, we have a couple examples. Um, on the left is an example of a pegmatitic tourmaline. Um, which is, was formed in one of these pockets. You know, it's a, it's a big crystal. It's quite gemmy, as you can see. It's got some crystals growing around it, but obviously this crystal had a lot of open space in which it could grow um, and to grow this big crystal, which is quite inclusion free. And on the right is just an example of an industrious miner uh, working into one of these pockets. You know, she's found this pocket. She's digging in for these gem, gem minerals now. This is kind of what you might see in a pegmatite if you were down under the ground in these, these mining environments. And so after that, we want to talk about one more topic, which is uh, in terms of geology of gem deposits, both diamonds and colored stones, this is an important distinction between primary and secondary deposits. So I'll tell you what those deposits are in the next slide, which is going to give you some detailed information. So basically a primary deposit is where the gems are found right in the host rock where they were formed or where they're um, right in the host rock without those gems having been released from the rock. And so it takes really intensive mining 
to get these gems out of the primary deposit because you have to do the work that mother nature could have done over millions of years in a secondary deposit. So a secondary deposit is where the gems have been liberated from their original host rock. Essentially, usually through millions of years of tropical weathering, um, mother nature can work its, its magic, release these gemstones from the rock and inter them in gem gravels. And miners really like the secondary deposits better because nature has done a lot of the work for them. It's easier to get gemstones out and oftentimes nature has kind of sorted the gems and concentrated them. Uh, whereas in primary deposits, you have to break those rocks apart to get the gems out. Now, on the other hand, geologists really like the primary deposits better because it has all of this um, original information about how the gemstones formed still there, waiting for you to study the, 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 um, the geology of the deposits. On the other hand, secondary deposits, geologists don't like those as much because a lot of that original geological context has been lost when these rocks have been weathered away. Um, and we'll show some examples of that next. So here we're showing a primary diamonds. Um, on the left is a, a photograph of a kimberlite pipe that's being mined out for these diamonds. These pipes, as you saw in the, one of the diagrams from Karn, these pipes are very um, kind of vertical. So you, these mines typically go down quite deep in this sort of a vertical fashion. And on the right are some uh, xenoliths that were found within the kimberlite. And so these were, the diamonds themselves are xenocrysts in the kimberlite. So they were, they're basically foreign minerals in the kimberlites. But these rocks we're showing here are xenoliths. These are foreign rocks within the kimberlites themselves. And so these are actually some of the, the rocks in which the diamonds formed. Uh, you have got all of the geology right there. You can study these rocks and, and get some better idea of how these diamonds are forming in the earth. And we can contrast that with secondary diamonds. So this is a deposit actually um, where the diamonds have been weathered away from their original host rock. And they were actually um, kind of sequestered in these conglomerates, which um, were later then kind of turned back into a rock, a meta conglomerate. Um, and so you find these diamonds in this conglomerate rock that is, has basically no geological context. You don't really know where those diamonds came from or what was the original host rock for them. Um, and so this is an example of a secondary diamond deposit. And we see the same thing for colored stones. So these are some photos from the Greenland Ruby deposit, which is one of the newer deposits to be mined economically for rubies. But as we'll show later, it's actually one of the older deposits in the world in terms of the geology. And you can see here, this is really hard rock. So not only is this kind of an isolated place, as you can see from the, the photo on the left, um, it's also difficult to mine these rubies because you have to get the rubies out of this hard rock. And so on the next photo, I'll show you actually the deposit. Um, we went there and visited and saw where they were actually mining. And it's, it's maybe a little hard to see here, but in the middle of the photo, you can see this slightly darker patch, which is going up and down in the photo. Um, that's where they're actually mining the rubies from. Actually, a little bit to the right. Yeah, this, this black line going up and down, that's where they're mining the rubies from. And all this rock surrounding it basically is uh, what you could call overburden. It's basically non-ruby bearing rocks. So you see those green cones there, that's where they're going to drill holes and blast away all that rock so that they can get to the ruby bearing ore um, a little more carefully and extract those rubies without breaking them up too much. And on the next slide, we'll show you what those guys are actually doing. Um, on the left is a miner. He's got one of these big uh, pink sausages, which is actually the explosive. And so he's putting this explosive into these holes and they're gonna then blast away all that overburden so that they can get at the rubies a little more carefully. Uh, and this just shows basically why it's so difficult to mine rubies in a primary deposit. And so what a miner would prefer is something like this. This is a, some photos from Mogok in Myanmar, which is like the legendary source of rubies and sapphires for centuries. Um, this is a secondary deposit. Not all of the deposits in Mogok are secondary, but a lot of them are. Um, and it's much easier to get the stones out in this case. So you've got on the left, these guys panning in the river for the gem gravels that have been um, where these rubies and sapphires might be concentrated. And on the right, you've got these guys blasting away this, um, these beds of gravel with these hydraulic wa water hoses. And so they're trying to wash the gem gravel downstream so that they can use gravitational settling to recover these, the dense rubies and sapphires. Um, and so this is a, a much easier way to mine gemstones in this case. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Karin. And Karin's gonna go a little more in depth about diamond trace elements and some of the work that she's been doing with diamonds.
um, about and telling us how they of the geological conditions of their formation. Uh, thank you very much, Aaron. Yeah, so that was an you know, interesting overview to show how you know, both diamonds and all the different minerals that make up colored stones um, actually have very similar formation conditions. You know, they all form from fluids or melts that are moving through different environments in the earth. And so diamonds are telling us about very specific conditions um, in a deeper part of the earth, in the mantle, whereas colored stones um, and their associated minerals and rocks are telling us about geological conditions that are happening in the crust, in the shallower portion of the earth. Um, and so all of these minerals, you know, diamonds and the gem quality um, colored stones that Aaron spoke about, are telling us about different geological processes that are happening in response to tectonic activity. So either, you know, melting or subduction, um, you know, mobilization of fluids and melts in the earth in response to tectonics is what is forming these minerals that we can then study. Um, and often they give us these beautiful, beautiful minerals like this. Um, so how do we actually then distinguish where different gem minerals come from? So um, a lot of, there's a lot of interest in sourcing um, diamonds that are being mined sustainably. And uh, there's a, a huge consumer interest in knowing country of origin for diamonds. Um, and so how they do country of origin for um, colored stones is they analyze the trace elements. But in the next few slides, I'm just going to explain briefly why diamond trace elements is a little bit more complicated um, than colored stone trace elements. Um, and it's, you know, it's not so trivial um, to, um, to do these analyses. Um, so uh, a question that we often get is, well, I have the exact same setup that the colored stone guys have. I have a laser and I have a quad. Um, can I measure trace elements in diamonds the same way that I do it for other minerals? And the short answer is no, you can't. Um, and uh, there's two main reasons for that. Um, the one is that the diamond lattice is almost pure carbon. So unlike tourmaline, the very complicated mineral example that Aaron will talk about later on, diamond is almost pure carbon. So there's not a lot of variability in the chemical composition. Um, it has very few other elements in sufficient concentration that we can actually measure and use. So the second most abundant element in diamonds is nitrogen. And nitrogen in natural diamonds uh, is on the order of 200 to 500 ppm, so parts per million. And so um, that's the second most abundant element in diamond. And so there's just not much that we're working with here. And so th that's the big issue is that for most trace elements that we're interested in, we simply cannot get above the background on our instrument. So if we're trying to make the measurement, we're not able to just get above background levels um, on the mass spectrometer. Um, the second main issue is that no one has a diamond standard. Um, and so I'll show why a diamond standard um, is important, but essentially there's no way to convert the signal that you're getting on the mass spec to actual concentration because no one has actually yet been able to develop a robust diamond standard that we could all use um, to make these measurements. Um, so how then is it even possible then to measure trace elements? Um, so Graham Pearson at the University of Alberta, previously at Durham University in the UK, um, he and his grad students um, have developed a technique um, that we can use to measure trace elements. And so it's currently, his lab is the only one in the world that is, um, that is set up to do this measurement. Um, there are some other people that are looking to set this up in their own labs, but currently these measurements are only possible in one lab in the world. Um, and so this is what's called an offline laser ablation technique, where you actually ablate the diamond first, take up all that ablated material and acid, and then measure it um, in solution. Um, and so that is in contrast to trace elements um, that Aaron routinely measures for colored stones, where they ablate the diamond and directly take that ablated material into the instrument um, to measure it. Um, and so for this technique, it's actually done in two, in two different steps. Um, and so this is um, sort of what that setup looks like. Um, so it's called a closed cell ablation. So you have cleaned, acid clean Teflon um, that you're using and it has a laser window, so it's transparent. And so you place your diamond here on the plinth. Um, and so just, this is the schematic if you look at it from the side. Um, so you have your clean Teflon and your laser window, and you can laser through that into the, to the diamond. So because I mentioned that diamonds are incredibly pure and they don't have a lot of impurities in them, 
it's necessary to ablate the diamonds for hours in order to get sufficient material um, that you can actually get above background on the instrument. Um, so for the trace elements that I've measured in some diamonds, I was ablating for five to six hours in order to get sufficient, um, sufficient concentrations of trace elements that I could measure. Um, other people use this technique to measure um, certain isotopes in diamonds. And I know that they've been ablating for much longer, for like 20, 30, 40 hours, in order to get sufficient amount, um, sufficient content of these different elements that they can then measure um, on the instrument. So this is a very time intensive technique in contrast to trace elements that they do routinely um, for colored stones. Um, so the, the ablation is not the only step. Um, you know, afterwards you need to take up the material in acid and then get it ready for trace element analyses. So I'm not gonna go through all of these stages, but it's basically just to show that, you know, there's a few different steps that you have to do before ablation. There's a few steps that you have to do after the ablation, and then you need to get your um, sample solution ready for analyses as well. Um, so all of this takes time. Um, and so on average, if you have a set of samples that you wanna analyze, maybe you have a set of like six or seven samples, it will probably take you two or three weeks um, in, in order to get, to get good usable data. Um, so the second issue that I mentioned was that you need a standard um, and that there's no, at the moment, there's no one that actually has a diamond standard um, developed for routine analysis by the online method um, that Aaron uses for colored stones. Um, but for the offline ablation, what you, what you can then do is you can make up a standard in solution so you have a matrix ma matched standard because it, both your sample and your standard are both in acid. Whereas um, when Aaron does colored stone trace elements, you need a matrix matched standard that's also a ruby if you're measuring ruby trace elements, an emerald if you're measuring emerald trace elements. And so for this offline ablation, you, are then, you then have a matrix matched standard in solution or in the same acid that your sample is in. And so this is sort of a routine geochemical technique where you take the signal um, for a specific element. So in this case, we're measuring rubidium. Or here I've just shown the curves for niobium, um, cesium, and cerium. And so where you take the signal in counts per second that you get off the instrument and you compare that to different standard solutions. So here we have like five different uh, standard solutions of different concentrations. And hopefully if you measured out your, your um, standards correctly, they should all plot nicely on a line. Um, and so you regress through that line and you take also the uncertainty on that regression um, and propagate that through then to your final concentration. But for every single element then, um, you need to have um, this regression through your standard concentrations so that you could then can convert any unknown counts per second. So if you have an unknown sample, you then just measure it on the instrument, you read off how many counts per second for that element and you extrapolate that to the line and you get the concentration um, for that specific element. Um, and so um, all of this is, you know, is quite a lot of work. And so hopefully in the future, we'd be able to do the direct ablation. But for the moment, um, the reason we cannot do this direct ablation is the detection limits and the standards. And so I've just shown this sort of graphically here compared to different diamond data. Um, and this is from John McNeil, who used to work with Graham Pearson. Um, so on the left are the concentrations for fibrous diamonds um, and gem quality diamonds here in red. Um, and on the right then shows the detection limits for the two different techniques. So the direct laser ablation technique that Aaron uses, um, the detection limit, the average sort of detection limit is given here at the top. Um, and for the offline ablation technique, the detection limit is given here at the bottom. And so you can see that for average gem quality diamonds, um, these red diamonds here, the concentrations in the diamond is very comparable to the background that you're measuring routinely on the instrument. And so there's no way to distinguish between instrument background and diamond. Whereas with the offline technique, the um, detection limit is much lower. So your diamond measurements up here, your background is over here. And so you're able to confidently separate between where your diamond measurement is and what your instrument background is. Whereas for the online technique, the background of the instrument is up here and it's comparable then to what you're measuring in diamond. And so there's no way to separate those two out. So I'll just skip over that one. 
Um, and so diamond trace elements is a lot of work because you have to spend a lot of time in the lab actually doing these analyses and getting it all set up. And it's not a routine, routine measurement just yet. And so for all this effort, um, what does diamond trace elements actually taught us? Um, so there's still a limited data set uh, for gem quality diamonds. Um, so there's only a handful of localities of, for gem quality diamonds that have actually been analyzed for their trace elements. And unfortunately at the moment, there's no clear fingerprint for these different localities. Um, most diamonds have generally similar trace element compositions, and that is because they form in generally similar geological environments um, deep in the earth. Um, so there are some compositional characteristics that excite geochemists, um, people like me and Evan and others, um, is that you know, we can distinguish um, certain, certain compositional characteristics um, in the diamond source. Um, for example, you know, there's differences in trace element concentrations between carbonatitic, saline and silicic fluids. There's slight differences between methane free and methane bearing fluids. But the reason we can't use these differences for actual fingerprinting between different localities is because most localities may have a mix of diamonds that are carbonatitic, saline and silicic. Um, for example, Diavik and Ikari certainly have a fibrous diamonds that have all of these fluids. Um, many localities have diamonds that um, have carbon that forms purely in the mantle, whereas, and also diamonds that have carbon that indicates a recycled origin. And so there's, at the moment, there's no clear signature that we can use to distinguish different localities. But there are compositional characteristics and differences that do excite geochemists, and it helps us to understand uh, diamond formation a little bit better. Um, and so then the next question, obviously, as well, can diamond fingerprinting ever be, be done? Um, and so I think there are suites of rough diamonds from particular localities that sometimes have very similar um, compositional characteristics or similar surface features, similar inclusion morphologies. Um, that then you can say, oh, this suite of diamonds looks like potentially it comes from Argyle because they have orange garnets, they have pink graining, um, they have, you know, hexagons on their surface. So we know that, you know, that is certainly consistent with coming from that locality. Um, so there's certain localities that may have um, very specific surface features and inclusions that are characteristic. Um, however, these characteristics are often lost um, after cutting and polishing. And so that always doesn't always track through then um, to the gem trade. Um, and so then the compositional features that we can rely on are, you know, carbon isotopes, trace elements, potentially, or nitrogen aggregation characteristics. Um, but however, you know, like the global diamond data set still has a lot of overlap. And so I'll just show, um, just for one of those, for carbon isotopes, um, I'll just show how similar the compositions are for different localities. Um, so what I've plotted here is the ratio of 12 carbon to 13 carbon relative to a standard of known composition. Um, and so that's then plotted as delta 13C. Um, it is given, the unit is per mole, and so that's basically parts per thousand. So any differences that we're measuring are very small. Um, they're in the third decimal place, so per mole. Um, and so the majority of mantle samples fall in this mantle range, so plotted here in gray. So that's between about like minus nine to minus four per mole. Um, and because diamonds come from the mantle, um, the majority of them have compositions in the mantle range. Um, and so there's probably 80% chance that if you pick up a diamond and measure its carbon, and you don't know where it comes from, it's gonna have a co composition somewhere um, in this range. And so there's not a lot that we can then use to distinguish different localities because their compositions are all so similar. Um, so here I've just shown um, these are from um, Pierre Cartini's review in 2014, where he plotted up just the more unusual localities in terms of carbon isotopes. So these are ones that sort of deviate from the main mantle range um, and that we know have, you know, they're characteristic for being distinct from other localities. However, these localities that are sort of distinct aren't ones that are currently in operation, really. Argyle is about to close. 
um, New South Wales isn't really being mined. Jericho is closed. Um, Yahochfontein is also closed. It's a historical locality. Um, so certainly, you know, for geochemists, you know, we can use this to under better understand diamond formation, but it wouldn't really be useful um, for diamonds that are that are sort of in the in the gem trade. Um, and so here's just an, another example of of diamonds from these from Arapa and Zhuaneng. Um, so both are localities um, in Botswana. And you can see that the majority of diamonds here still, all of them have a mode around minus five. Um, this is sort of the main mantle range. And so yes, there are diamonds that deviate off to lighter carbon isotopic compositions, um, but really the majority of diamond localities worldwide have carbon isotopic compositions that largely overlap with each other. And, and so it's not easy to um, do diamond fingerprinting if you don't know where the diamond is from. Um, and so that is um, why we have the Diamond Origin Report that is a matching service where we have a known rough um, or a rough from a known locality that we then match to a cut stone that comes back. Um, we never just have a, a stone from an unknown origin and then tell you where it's from because it's simply not possible based on either carbon isotopes or nitrogen concentration or content aggregation state or trace elements. Um, at the moment, there's nothing that anyone in the world, any scientist can use to confidently say where a diamond is coming from. And so that's why um, the, the Diamond Origin Report, you know, it's a matching service because at the moment that is um, sort of uh, what, what anyone is, is able to do. Um, and so with that, I'll head it over to Aaron, who's gonna talk about why colored stone trace elements is way easier to do <laughs> than diamonds. Thanks. Um, so I want to start with corundum. <clears throat> and so on, on the next slide, I show the, um, this is the atomic structure of corundum. Uh, and this, it helps to kind of go through this just to kind of explain what we're talking about with trace elements in corundum and other colored stones. So what we see in this uh, diagram is blue balls, which are uh, atoms of aluminum, and red balls, which are atoms of oxygen. Now, uh, and the, the sticks between the red balls and the blue balls are the atomic bonds between the aluminum and the oxygen. If we look at this in, in a different way on the next slide, um, <clears throat> what you're seeing now is you're looking basically down the C-axis of corundum, or from a gemological perspective, you're looking down the optic axis of the corundum. And it, it kind of helps to explain what a trace element is by telling you that trace elements are often the chromophores that we have in corundum. So Karin went over this a little bit previously, but for instance, if you took some of those aluminum atoms, rip, ripped them out of the structure and uh, replaced them with chromium, then you would find that those chromium atoms are absorbing light and specifically they're absorbing a lot of blue and green light in the corundum. So then the light that comes through is absorbed by the chromium and what you get is all the red light that's not absorbed by the chromium. And this is of course what happens in a ruby. And the next slide we show another example. We take two trace elements, iron and titanium, if you rip out two alumin aluminum atoms out of the structure and replace them with an iron and a titanium each, those iron titanium pairs will absorb a lot of the red light. You let all the blue light through and you get a blue sapphire. And it's, it's important to kind of um, think about it this way because it only takes like 10 parts per million of iron titanium pairs to get a nice blue color. And what I mean by parts per million is if you had a million atoms of corundum, of aluminum and oxygen in the corundum structure, you would only need to replace 10 of those with iron titanium pairs to get a nice blue color. With chromium, it's a little more, you need probably hundreds to thousands of parts per million of chromium to get a nice red color. Uh, but these are basically what trace elements are. So in the next slide, I'll go over some of the trace elements we typically find. Routinely in corundum, we find trace elements like magnesium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, iron, and gallium. These are basically the, the six trace elements that we can kind of rely on finding when we do this technique that Karen mentioned, laser ablation, ICPMS. And all of those trace elements, except for gallium, also play a role in determining the color of a gem corundum. So magnesium is important for the titanium iron pairs, and it's also important for what we, for certain chromophores called trapped holes, which give you a nice yellow orangey color. Vanadium can also give you color in these, in these stones as well. So these are all important for looking at not only trace elements, but chromophores in these stones. And so on the next slide, I'm gonna just go over this diagram really briefly again. I'm not gonna dwell too much on it, but I just wanna put this up there to remind you guys that the number of ways in which we can form gem corundum is incredibly diverse. 
Um, in the Earth's crust, we have all these different environments, all these different geological situations that you can create corundum in. And all these different situations are going to give you different kinds of corundum. And so I want to advance a, a hypothesis right now, which is that um, with these different types of gem corundum, uh, I would say that the hypothesis is the trace element profiles of these gem corundums will be controlled by the geological conditions under which the gem corundum formed. So hypothetically, uh, a metamorphic gem corundum might look different than a magmatic gem corundum in terms of its trace element profile. So let's test this hypothesis. On the next slide, we can actually see some, some of these diagrams. Um, what we're showing here on the left, you see a diagram using certain trace elements like chromium, gallium, iron, and titanium. And from all the data we've collected so far, when you plot metamorphic sapphires versus metam metamorphic sapphires against magmatic sapphires, there is generally a pretty clear separation using trace elements like this. So on this diagram on the left, you can see on the bottom part of the diagram, these are the magmatic sapphires. On the top part of the diagram, you have sapphires from Mogok, Nilkaka, and Ratnapura, so Sri Lanka and Madagascar. These sapphires can be pretty easily separated from those magmatic sapphires using these trace elements. On the right is another diagram using iron, gallium, and magnesium. And again, this just shows that using these trace elements, we can separate metamorphic and magmatic sapphires pretty easily. So this hypothesis seems to be supported by the data. Yes, the, the trace element profiles in these gem corundums seem to be controlled by the geological conditions in, under which the gem corundum formed. Now, where we go from there? The big question is not necessarily just geological origin though, right? So a lot of the trade wants to know geographic origin. So we can take this hypothesis a little bit further and say, well, if you have two deposits that are geographically distinct, um, hypothetically, those two deposits might also have different geological origins for the gem corundum in those in, in there. So if that is the case, then you would also then expect that these two ge geographic origins, the gem corundum from those deposits would have different trace element profiles as well. So let's see if that's actually supported by the data. In the next slide, um, we show an example of what we call high iron rubies. These are rubies from Mozambique, Thailand, Cambodia, and Madagascar, among others. But these are the kind of the most important economically deposits. And what you see on the left of the diagram is a vanadium magnesium plot showing Madagascar, Mozambique, and Thai Cambodian rubies. And there's pretty good separation using these trace elements. Uh, and with other trace elements as well, we can almost always separate these three deposits from each other, which seems to suggest that these deposits had different geological origins. So the ruby found in these deposits was geologically different in some way. And this also actually seems to be supported by looking at the inclusions in these stones. So if we look at the inclusions in Mozambique, Thai, and Madagascar rubies, they typically have slightly different appearances. And in case of the Thai rubies, very different appearances, which also seems to suggest that they had different geological origins, which would have given these different inclusions. Now we can turn to a little bit of a more difficult situation in the next slide. These are marble-hosted rubies. So from <clears throat> Southeast Asia up to Central Asia, we have several of these marble-hosted ruby deposits. I mentioned earlier that uh, the deposit in Burma at Mogok is kind of like the classical version of these marble-hosted rubies. But you find them in another deposit in Burma, you find them in Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan. And if you click forward one, you'll see some examples of these. So on the left is an Afghan ruby hosted in a marble. And on the right is a Burmese ruby hosted in marble as well. So from a mineralogical perspective, these are very similar. Uh, it's basically just chromium bearing corundum in a calcite host rock. So basically the, the problem here is that it's possible these deposits all had very similar geological origins because they're all marble hosted rubies. They all formed in the same tectonic event when the Indian subcontinent came crashing into the Eurasian plate, creating the Himalayas and creating a lot of metamorphic events that form these marbles. So let's see if we can actually use trace elements to separate marble hosted rubies from these different deposits. And what you see here is a plot of, again, vanadium versus magnesium for these rubies. And automatically you can see there's a whole lot more overlap in the trace element profiles from rubies from these deposits. Uh, so you can see that it, we have some statistical methods that we use to sort of try to separate this a little further. Uh, we have one we call the selective plotting method, which is based on a 
the K nearest neighbor statistical method in which we essentially look not only at vanadium and magnesium, but all of the trace elements of the Ruby all together. And we can sort of filter out the data to compare the Ruby against only other rubies from with similar overall trace element chemistry. And this helps sometimes, but I, even with this statistical methodology, it doesn't always separate all these marble hosted rubies. There are still some marble hosted rubies from different deposits, which have basically completely overlapping chemistry, which we really cannot separate using chemistry alone. So this kind of tells us that at some point this hypothesis breaks down that geographic origin should have different trace element profiles because some of these different geographic origin deposits, they have such similar geological origins that the trace element profiles can oftentimes be indistinguishable from each other. Now, I wanna end this on a little bit of a happier note with tourmalines. So uh, tourmalines are a little bit of an easier situation for us. And if you go to the next slide, we're gonna talk specifically about paraeba tourmaline. Um, like I mentioned previously in the talk, these are the copper bearing tourmalines and it's mostly L-bite tourmaline so a sodium lithium aluminum rich end member of tourmaline, but you also sometimes see lidocodite with a lot of copper in it, which can qualify as a pyreba tourmaline as well. The copper, like I said, gives this nice bright blue color. Uh, typically they're, or right now they're found in Brazil, Nigeria, and Mozambique. And there's a big demand in the trade to separate stones from these different deposits. Uh, so on the next slide, just bringing this one up again, uh, just to show you that this is the typical environment in which you would form a paraeba tourmaline, this pegmatite, this big pocket in the earth, which is resulting from some granitic fluid, late stage granitic fluid, carrying strange elements like beryllium and beryl uh, and, and boron and other elements like that. And so this is the same situation that you will find in Mozambique, Nigeria, and Brazil. And look in the next slide a little further at this, this is a map of the earth. It may look a little unfamiliar, but if you look closely, you can see some familiar landforms, right? So you might see, you might notice the outline of South America in this diagram. You might notice the outline of Africa as well. And maybe you'll see Australia off to the side, the Indian subcontinent, a little bit of North America down at the bottom left. This essentially is a, a map of the earth, maybe 600 million years ago, uh, when there was this tectonic event that caused this agglomeration of all the, the Earth's continental masses into what we call a supercontinent. And in this, super, this event, we had these deposits in Brazil, Nigeria, and Mozambique all squished together in this big supercontinent of Gond Gondwana. And so not only are these tourmalines formed in similar geological environments, but they were also formed in exactly the same geological event as well. And so they all, they all have very similar ages. And so these deposits are probably gonna be very similar geologically. Now there's one saving grace with this, which is gonna be shown on the next slide. This is what's gonna help us here. This is the tourmaline atomic structure. It's a lot more complicated than the corundum, as you can see. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but it's just to show you that there's a lot of different ways we can stuff different atoms into the tourmaline structure. And on the next slide, we show a little bit more of that. I just wanted to interrupt here and just say, it's a lot more complicated than diamond, right? So like diamond has carbon, very simple chemical structure, um, and then like tourmaline is this. Yeah, and there's even like a progression, right? From diamond to corundum to tourmaline, yeah. where it gets, it gets progressively easier to put different types of trace elements in there. And it makes our trace element measurements um, a little easier. Uh, yeah. So with tourmaline, we have this general chemical formula. And I'm not gonna go over that either. Uh, you can study this later if you want, but basically suffice it to say, there's a lot of different ways you can stuff a lot of different elements in the tourmaline. And so the reason this might help us is that we could also hypothesize that this complex chemical formula and this complex atomic structure might make tourmaline more sensitive to small changes in the geological environment in which it forms. So even though overall these deposits in Brazil, Nigeria, and Mozambique might be very similar geologically, with this complex structure, you might get very small variations in the chemistry regardless of the similar geological environments. And so we'll show you the data on the next slide. Uh, these are chemical plots using a variety of different elements that we use routinely in the lab. And for us in the lab for origin for paraeba tourmaline, we use copper, zinc, gallium, lead, tin, and strontium. And we find that um, with almost all of the paraeba tourmaline that comes in the lab, we can confidently separate these stones from these different deposits using these trace elements. And so this seems to support our hypothesis that 
with a more complicated structure, geographic origin becomes easier because you have all these different ways you can put different trace elements into the structure, which makes the chemistry a little more sensitive to slight variations in the geology in these different deposits. And so with that, I think I'm gonna hand that back over to Karin again. She's gonna tell us a little bit about ages of diamonds and, and other stones as well. Um, yeah, so we're gonna talk about ages of diamonds, obviously, favorite topic, but also ages of minerals that Aaron studies. Um, so I think like everyone's aware of the, you know, the phrase diamonds are forever, uh, but may not be aware that there's many minerals. Um, there's some minerals that are older than diamonds, and there's certainly a lot of minerals that have a com comparable age history to diamonds as well. Um, so we'll just show you first sort of an overview of, of diamond ages and then show you some interesting examples of other old, um, other old minerals. Um, so some people may have seen this, um, seen this sort of timeline before. I've showed it in a few talks already. Um, so we have the age of the earth, which is 4.56 billion years old. Um, and then the oldest diamonds that we know of formed 1 billion years later only. So 3.5 to 3.3 billion years ago. And so these are diamonds from Ikati and Dyvik um, in Northern Canada, where Evan's from. Um, so there's some rocks that are even older than diamonds. Um, also surprisingly from Canada. Uh, so uh, the Acasta rocks in, in Northern Canada and then the Nouvaagatuk rocks um, in Northern Quebec. Um, so both of these localities are actually Hadean, so older than 4 billion years. Um, so these are older than diamonds, um, but the oldest diamonds are these ones from Ikari and Dyvik. Um, and importantly, um, I always make the point that the oldest diamonds that we know of were forming prior to oxygen arising in our atmosphere. So prior to there being abundant life on Earth, um, the oldest rocks and minerals were already forming um, and diamonds were forming deep in the Earth. Um, and then, you know, diamonds have been forming all through Earth's history. Um, and so there's also um, a lot of examples of what geologists love to call younger diamonds, even though they're millions of years old. Um, but, you know, because um, geologists speak in terms of billions of years, um, for us, you know, 90 to 60 million years ago is just the other day. Um, so the youngest diamonds that we know of are from South Africa, where I'm from. Um, so the youngest diamonds um, that have been dated are from Jachersfontein and Koffiefontein um, in South Africa. Um, and there's not many of these younger diamonds, uh, but there are, I think there's uh, two diamonds that have been dated um, that are um, this young. Uh, and then there's also some of um, diamonds from Victor that are 720 million years old. Um, diamonds that I worked on from Zimi that are 650 million years old. Um, and so here the point is that even the youngest diamonds that we know are formed prior to the dinosaurs becoming extinct. So the dinosaurs died due to a huge meteorite impact around 65 million years ago. Um, but even before that is the youngest diamonds that we know of had already been formed. Um, and so certainly there's no, way, no reason to think that diamonds aren't still forming right now. Um, so certainly, you know, uh, deep in the earth right now, certainly diamonds are probably forming. Uh, we just have no way to go there to witness the event. Um, and also, we need to actually study the diamonds, destroy them, get the inclusions out in order to actually date them. And so with more dating studies, potentially we can still find younger diamonds and we could still find older diamonds. Um, maybe those studies just haven't been done yet or maybe we have already found the oldest diamonds and that record will never be extended. Um, the only way we know is you know, by doing, uh, doing more work on more inclusion bearing diamonds. Um, and so here's um, you know, just an overview of all the diamonds that have ever been dated. Um, and this just sort of shows the complexity even within a single locality. Um, so the example that we gave from um, Dyavik and Ikari where we had the oldest diamonds, 3.5, 3.3 billion years ago is when they were forming. There are also diamonds from Dyavik that are younger, around 1.9 billion years old, and diamonds that are even younger that form close to the time of Kimberlite eruption. So most diamond localities have multiple diamond formation events. Um, and so even though you have a diamond from Ikadi and Dyavik, it's not to say that that particular diamond that you have in your hand is 3.5 billion years old. Uh, because there's also other age populations um, from the same mine. And that's certainly true for many localities. Urapa in Botswana also has a number of different diamond formation events. Um, and so we know that, you know, diamonds are continuously forming in response to different geological events. 
similar to what Erin spoke about for, um, for colored stones, you know, where we have mantle plumes coming up, we have collision, we have subduction. And so all these minerals and diamonds are forming in response to these reworking events. And that is why we have diamond formation all through Earth's history. Um, and most localities have these multiple diamond forming, um, diamond forming events. Um, okay, so how old are the other minerals? Um, are they just as old? Um, so these are examples of non-gem quality minerals, but minerals nevertheless, um, and minerals still contained within, within rocks. So the oldest mineral that we know of is from Jack Hills. Um, that's a zircon that is around 4.4 billion years old. Um, the, the zircon is contained within much younger conglomerates, but the, this is the record for the oldest mineral um, on Earth. Um, and then the other rocks that I mentioned already from, from Canada, from uh, Quebec and from the Northwest Territories, Nouveau-Aguitoc and Acasta, both of these are terrains um, that have rocks that are older than four, four billion years old. Um, and so here's just sort of an overview then of, first we're gonna do like the oldest minerals and then we're gonna do the youngest minerals. So I mentioned the oldest mineral is a zircon from Jack Hills. Um, and what's interesting is it's actually not even the whole zircon, it's only the core. So the core has, has a portion of zircon that has been dated to 4.37 billion years ago, um, but the rim has, has been dated to 3.4 billion years ago. Uh, there's really old twimelines from Greenland, uh, 3.8 to 3.7 billion years ago. I mentioned the oldest diamonds, 3.5. Um, the oldest emeralds from South Africa, 2.97 billion years ago. Um, and our colleague Mandy Krebs um, dated some um, uh, rubies from Greenland, and they are almost 2.7 billion years old. Um, so certainly, you know, diamonds are certainly forever, you know, because they formed a long time ago, and they seem to be really robust because of the extreme hardness. However, there are also other minerals um, that also extend just as far, um, just as far back in time. Um, and then just some examples of the youngest uh, minerals. So the youngest diamonds I already mentioned from South Africa. Um, and then there's some young emeralds and young corundums, um, just a few million years old um, from Pakistan and Australia. Um, and then here is a sort of just a spiral showing, um, you know, the, from the oldest to the youngest, um, just for emeralds. Um, so this is taken from Giuliani and Grote. Um, and it shows um, here are the oldest emeralds from Gravelot in South Africa, 2.97 billion years, so during the um, Archean. But really that emeralds have been forming all through Earth's history, um, you know, up until the youngest um, emerald formation in the Cenozoic um, just 9 million years ago. And so emeralds um, and corundum um, have been forming for over 3 billion years, so really extending all through Earth's history. So diamonds, emeralds, corundum, really all minerals um, span geological time all the way from the beginning of Earth's history um, till now. The, Karen, I just want to say that one interesting thing about that diagram, um, not only do you have emeralds that are 3 billion years old and 9 million years old, but they formed in geologically very similar deposits. So these are both the, um, the magmatic related schistosin deposits. So it sort of speaks to the fact that a lot of the geological processes happening in the Earth's crust three billion years ago are very similar to what we're seeing still nine million years ago. And I think that's kind of a, a really neat thing to think about with, you know, what these colored stones are telling us. Yeah, and that, I think that's certainly something that, you know, diamond studies have been trying to sort of figure out as well is um, how does plate tectonics today compare to plate tectonics uh, back in the Archean and the Hadean? And when did plate tectonics actually start? And so studying minerals and diamonds and looking at it from different angles, looking at it from the mantle, looking at it from the crust, uh, we're able to then, you know, extend all the way back in time and sort of try to figure out how uniform different plate tectonic processes have been. And when did plate tectonics, as we see it today, when did it start um, back in time? Was it, you know, 3.5, 3.6? Um, you know, when exactly did that transition, did that transition um, occur? Um, and so we've reached nearly the end of our presentation. Um, so it's been, it's been pretty long. So if you're still with us, thank you. Um, so we just have, a, you know, it's a couple of slides just to sort of wrap up and, and, you know, each to speak to the importance of, you know, I'll speak to a bit about diamonds and, and Aaron will speak a little bit about colored stones, just why they're important for the study of the earth. So, um, 
for me and certainly for Evan, I'll just speak on his behalf that, um, you know, Evan's studies on, you know, these beautiful blue diamonds from deep in the earth and the clipper diamonds um, have allowed us to understand the deep earth in a way that we wouldn't be able to understand if it wasn't for diamonds. So the deep earth would remain inaccessible to us if it wasn't for Kimberlite eruptions bringing them up to the surface and then mining companies actually then exploiting them and doing some diamond mining for us. So if it wasn't for Kimberlite eruption and diamond mining, um, you know, we wouldn't have access to these diamonds and we wouldn't have the information that we have about the deep earth. And so for me that, you know, that is a great thing about diamonds is it's coming from an inaccessible part of the earth. Um, and so some of the studies that I have done on shallower diamonds um, have taught us about, you know, the most ancient processes on earth. Um, so they can actually teach us about the mantle below the oldest continents and how the continents that we live on today, how they got their stability. Um, and so um, now I'll hand over to Aaron and he can tell us just a little bit about, you know, what other minerals are telling us. Yeah, I, I think I kind of want to just echo a little bit what Karen said is that it, it's really, I think what we're trying to do now is show how these are not just gemstones, they're not just pretty things you can wear on your, in your jewelry, but these are little time capsules of the earth and they can teach us about the evolution of plate tectonics and the mantle and in terms of color stones, they can teach us about the evolution of the earth's crust and how different tectonic events happened and exactly what unfolded during these, these tectonic events. Um, and we're a little bit, you know, with color stones, I think we're, we're a little bit behind you guys with the diamonds, but we're actually, you guys have done a lot of great work with using inclusions and all these different things to, to study the diamonds and get more at the geology. But we're trying to emulate that more, I think, with colored stones and get a little more into the nitty gritty of how these color stones formed and what they tell us about the earth. Yeah, and so here's just sort of our last slide, really just summing up um, then really that, you know, all the minerals that we have available for, um, for us to study at GIA, all of them are valuable because they teach us about, um, about the earth, how our planet formed and how it continues to evolve. Um, and so we spoke about how different minerals form, how diamonds are forming in different environments in the earth in response to fluid or melt mobilization. And we saw that, you know, those are similar processes that are happening in the crust for other, for, um, other minerals. And so we have similar processes, you know, subduction, collision, mantle plumes, um, you know, melts and fluids moving through the mantle and the crust. Um, and that is what's forming um, these different minerals. Um, and since mineral formation is linked to plate tectonics, as we've said, um, they can teach us a lot about how the continents are forming. And because minerals, including diamonds, emeralds, corundum, all of them have been forming all through Earth's history, um, they allow us to investigate the Earth um, very far, um, far back in time. Um, and so with that, we'd like to thank all the great photographers at GIA um, for the awesome photos um, that we've been able to use during this presentation. Um, in some cases, we may have forgot to give credit on the specific slides, but you know, here are all the people that have, that have taken all these amazing photographs. So thank you very much to them. Um, and then with that, I see Evan has been super busy plodding along, typing answers for the Q&A, but hopefully he left a few of, few of us, few of the questions for us to answer as well. Um, so um, we look forward to answering them. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Karen and Aaron, for that incredible overview. We do have lots of interesting questions from the audience. I've tried to sort of group some of them together so we can cover more ground here. Uh, but I first just wanted to touch on, we, we ended up talking about ages here. And there was a question that kind of was interesting to me about Carbonado Diamond. I think someone is suggesting that it, it could be older than three or three and a half billion years probably because of the suggestion that it might be extraterrestrial in origin. So could you tell us something about Carbonado? What should we expect that age to be? Interesting question. Thank you for that. Um, so Carbonado, I don't think has ever actually really been dated based on the, based on the inclusions. Certainly Steve Haggerty has done a lot of work on Carbonado and um, there is a, there is a hypothesis that Carbonado could be coming from, from sort of outer space. Um, that they um, are meteoritic samples that have sort of landed on Earth. Um, if they are solar system samples, um, then they'll be the same age, at, same age as, as the Earth and all the other planets. So they'll be 4.5 billion years old. Um, if they are um, pre-solar, then they'll be older than 4.5. So um, who knows? Um, I doubt they're pre-solar grains. So they're probably 4.5 billion or younger. 
um, coming from our solar system. Um, until we actually have dated them using inclusions, um, we won't be able to say exactly how old they are. Yeah, certainly very bizarre samples. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so there have been a, a bunch of questions about sort of the relationships between secondary deposits and primary deposits. You know, where do these uh, stones, especially colored stones, come from that end up in rivers and alluvial deposits? And is it actually possible to trace a stone not just back to its secondary deposit, but from there back to its primary deposit? How would you even do that? Yeah, that can be... Um... It's quite tricky, right? So in certain places like in Sri Lanka and um, Madagascar, you've had millions of years of tropical weathering. And in, in a place like Sri Lanka, it's this island that's mostly made up of hard metamorphic rocks. So we, we sort of generally know where the sapphires would have come from in this deposit. But I think even to this day, we really haven't found any we found in situ corundum in some of these metamorphic rocks, but we really haven't found no one's sort of traced back those sapphires that we find in the, in the gem gravels directly to like a rock that has exactly the same type of sapphire directly in the host rock. So we're, we're still a little bit uncertain of exactly like what the geological origins would have been for those Sri Lankan sapphires. Now, one thing we can do is we can look at the inclusions and the inclusions in some cases, you know, if you can find different minerals in those sapphires, that might give you a clue as to what the original host rock would have looked like. Um, so that's sort of one thing you can do with these secondary deposits to try to get some more information about what the primary rock would have looked like. But in, in a lot of cases, we're still, we're kind of in the dark about um, what those primary rocks would have looked like. You know, we know in Sri Lanka, it was a metamorphic rock, but we don't exactly know in, in a lot of cases what that what metamorphic rock looked like. Yeah, and so maybe from the diamond side, I can add a few things. Um, and so, yeah, certainly, as Aaron said, it's not always possible to trace back to the primary deposit. Um, so in South Africa, for example, there's a lot of diamonds on the west coast of South Africa. Um, um, and, you know, like along the coast um, and in the sea. And um, they are thought to come, you know, from the diamond deposits close to Kimberley. But there's no, there's not always, you can't always track it to exactly which Kimberlite it came from. Um, they are... Um, some suggestions that if you can do argon argon isotopes on the diamonds themselves, you may be able to get an eruption age, and that could you could then try to track that back to kimberlite age, and then you maybe have some indication of which kimberlite it came from. Um, but certainly, I think it is a challenge, and there are many diamond deposits where the primary deposit is not known. Um, so you have the alluvial deposit, but you know, we don't know exactly where that primary deposit is. And that's a good example is the Morangi deposits in eastern Zimbabwe, where they're now hosted in a conglomerate. They're, that's 1.1 billion years old, but the primary source uh, for those diamonds have never been found. Um, and I think that certainly is still an exploration target. Yeah, exactly. Another question here, uh, sort of comparing secondary and primary deposits. Uh, are secondary deposits, like in, in river gravels and things like that, are they potentially more economic to mine or um, more environmentally friendly to mine, potentially, in terms of their impact compared to primary deposits? Go first. I'll go second. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, especially with colored stones, uh, the secondary deposits are much easier to mine. Um, you're not breaking rocks up, you're, you're moving dirt. And you're also not, you know, with primary deposits, oftentimes you're having to blast into the rock with explosives, which has the potential to, potent to maybe break the gemstones as well. So you've already let mother nature release these, these gems from the rocks. And there's oftentimes the better quality stones get preserved a little better with these secondary deposits because you're not having to blast them out, but nature has kind of already worn those nice gems out and they've been tumbled through the river a little bit probably so anything that was gonna break would have broken already and you're left with oftentimes better quality stuff in these secondary deposits so yeah it's generally easier to mine those deposits uh, in terms of the environment i think both both types of mining are probably very similar you're you're mostly just moving rock and as long as you're not letting all this this sediment if you have a good environmental plan for keeping sediment from 
being washed into the stream at an abundant rate. Um, and for re rehabilitating the mining site after you're done, uh, most of this types of gem mining can be done quite in an environmentally friendly manner. But I'll let Karin talk about the diamond situation. It's probably slightly different. Well, I think it, for the secondary deposits, it's certainly, I think I'm, I'll have a similar answer to what Aaron had for colored stones, is that you know diamonds would then be in a river environment, be pre-concentrated. Um, so often then you have a higher grade and so it's more, maybe slightly more economic or easier. Um, and also with the quality of the diamonds, you know, because the diamonds are being tumbled around, um, the poorer quality stones may be already being broken up if they're being fractured or whatever. Um, and so maybe you're left with a, you know, the higher quality um, diamonds that are more concentrated than they would have been um, in a Kimberlite pipe. Um, as for the economic um, impact, Actually, most diamond and gemstone mining is relatively environmentally friendly compared to most other types of mining because you don't have to use any chemicals to extract, um, to extract the minerals from the host rocks. Um, so if you're mining platinum, platinum group elements um, or copper or gold or any of those things, um, there's a lot of chemical processing that needs to be done in order to extract, um, extract those elements um, from the rocks. Um, and so those could be detrimental to the environment. However, for diamonds and gemstone mining, it's all just mechanical. You're really just breaking up the rock and getting the mineral out. Um, and so there's no harmful chemicals that you're using in the process. Um, and so it's actually the most environmentally friendly of all the different, of all the types of mining um, that they are. And certainly uh, diamond mining, um, all of these large mining companies are heavily regulated and they have to comply with very, very strict environmental impact um, assessments that they have to do prior to even getting a mining license. Um, and certainly they need to have a mine closure plan um, when mining is completed, where they have to rehabilitate the site. Um, and so all of this is, um, you know, it's strictly controlled. Um, and so most diamond and gemstone mining is not that harmful to, to the environment. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's shift our discussion here into geographic origin. A lot of questions about that. Um, some people want to know why is it easier to identify potentially the geographic origin of minerals with a more complex chemical formula? And, and how does that compare with diamond? What might the approach look like in terms of trying to analyze trace elements or carbon isotopes? So how do you actually identify the geographic origin of anything and how do diamonds and colored stones compare? You know where it comes from. <laughs> To geographic origin. No, I'm kidding. Um, so um, with diamond, like you have carbon, most the, the diamond structure is mostly carbon. Um, and so what are you going to use to determine origin? Um, because all diamonds are carbon and there's some nitrogen in there. Um, and so it's very difficult. Um, and trace element analyses is difficult to do for diamonds. It's only it's a very recent technique. It's only been developed in the last 10 years. Um, and so hopefully maybe with um, you know, instruments are getting um, more sensitive. Uh, so with better instrumentation, better methodology, um, things will maybe get easier and simpler and more routine for diamonds. Uh, but certainly right now we're able to do the measurements. We're able to do trace element measurements for diamonds. It's just not routine just yet. Um, it's time intensive, it's destructive. Um, and so that's why there's only a few localities that have been done so far. Um, and then I'll let Aaron take over for the more complicated minerals. Yeah, so with, with origin determination in colored stones, what we're essentially doing is uh, we have some previous webinars about this concept of the field gemology department. So we have field gemology group, which is a bunch of ge gemologists who go out in the field and collect reference stones as close to the source as possible. And so what, what we do is we have, you know, reference stones from Burma, Sri Lanka, and Madagascar for blue sapphires. And what we do is we then analyze all the properties of these stones. And it's kind of a matching game from there. So we, match, we try to match inclusions of an unknown stone against those of our reference samples. We try to match trace elements of our unknown stone against all of our reference stones as well. And so the reason that co a more complex mineral is easier is that uh, when you're matching, you're matching a set of variables. You have a set of variables you can measure on your unknown and a set of variables you've already measured on your reference stones. So the more options for variables that you can match against your reference and your unknown, it just makes it easier. It makes it more likely that you're going to be able to match with a higher level of accuracy. 
when you have more variables to deal with. So tourmaline has a lot more trace elements we can measure. There's more variables that we can try to match between our reference and our unknowns. And so that's kind of why it's a little easier the more complex it gets. Yeah, and then back to diamonds, that's why we have the matching service. So same as what Aaron was saying, like they have as, you know, reference collection from a certain place and they know what the chemical composition of um, those stones would be and then they, they do a matching back to that reference collection. And so for the, for the diamond origin report, um, when the stones are submitted rough, we know where the stones are coming from. So they're submitted with a locality saying these are diamonds from South Africa um, and then once the stone is cut, so we document it, we do all the spectroscopy, we know exactly what its characteristics are. Um, and then when the stone comes back, once it's been um, cut and polished, um, we measure everything again and we make sure that it's the same stone. Um, and so in that way for diamonds, we're able to say then what the origin of the diamond is. But that is only because we know where the stone came from originally. Um, so I don't think at the moment with you know, current capabilities, um, or with current scientific knowledge, I should say, I don't think it's possible to take an unknown diamond, a diamond from an unknown place and then determine its origin. Um, that's at the, at the moment, that's beyond scientific capability. Right. So then the strategy is to pick the diamond up and hold on to that information when yeah. you extract it from the earth. You know where it comes from. And if we can track it through all the steps, you can hold on to the origin information. Yeah, and so I think that's the best way that we have to do diamond origin, is to hold on to the origin information from the beginning um, so that scientists don't have to try then after the fact, try to get that information back. It's a more robust approach, yeah. Okay, well, I think we have to end our discussion there, even though there are uh, lots of Lots of great questions that could be posed here. Uh, if you do have any other lingering questions, please find us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and of course, the GIA website. Join us again next week when we'll be joined by Dr. Sally Magania for a knowledge session on pink diamonds. And as always, thanks for watching. Thanks everyone. Goodbye. Thanks.